Vertigo has many causes, from inner ear crystals to strokes. But in Sjogren's syndrome, vertigo often follows a very different pathway involving immune-driven nerve and brain involvement. That's what we're breaking down today. If you're interested in this gist, hit the like button, subscribe and type interested in the comments, and I will give you a heart. If you've ever been told your MRI is normal, your ears look fine, or this is just anxiety, aging or stress, yet the spinning keeps coming back, this is not random. For many people with Sjogren's, vertigo is not a simple balance issue. It's a neurological signal that the immune system is interfering with how the brain processes movement. To understand why this keeps getting missed, we need to rebuild the story of vertigo from the ground up. Vertigo is not just feeling lightheaded or weak. It is the false sensation that you or your surroundings are moving when neither actually is. Some people feel like the room is spinning. Others feel pulled to one side, pushed backward, or as if the floor is tilting beneath them. The sensation can be brief or relentless, mild or completely disabling. What matters is this. Vertigo is a signal error. Your brain constantly calculates where you are in space using three information streams. Your eyes report what the world looks like. Your muscles and joints report where your body is positioned. And your vestibular system in the inner ear reports how your head is moving in relation to gravity. When these three systems agree, balance feels effortless. You walk, turn, stand, and move without thinking about it. But when even one of these inputs sends conflicting information, the brain interprets the mismatch as movement that is not actually happening. That is vertigo. The reason vertigo feels so violent is because the brain treats balance errors as a survival threat. Nausea, sweating, panic, eye flickering, and the urge to lie completely still are not overreactions. They are protective reflexes designed to stop movement until the brain can regain orientation. This is where most explanations stop. They assume the error comes from a mechanical issue in the inner ear or a visible lesion in the brain. In autoimmune disease, and especially in Sjogren's syndrome, the error often comes from something more subtle and more disruptive. The signals themselves are being distorted. Inflammation can slow nerve conduction, disrupt timing, and interfere with how the brain integrates balance information. The result is vertigo that does not follow classic patterns, does not respond predictably to standard treatments, and often gets labeled as unexplained. Understanding vertigo as a processing problem, not just a structure problem, is the key to understanding why Sjogren's patients are so often misdiagnosed. Sjogren's syndrome is usually introduced as a condition that dries out the eyes and mouth. That description is incomplete and misleading. Sjogren's is a systemic autoimmune disease, meaning the immune system can target multiple organs, tissues, and nerve pathways throughout the body. When it comes to vertigo, the most important thing to understand is that Sjogren's does not need to damage a structure to disrupt its function. It only needs to interfere with signaling. The immune system can inflame nerves, irritate small blood vessels, and alter how information travels between the inner ear, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. Even mild inflammation can slow signal transmission just enough to create timing errors between balance systems. The brain receives mixed messages and reacts as if movement is happening when it is not. This is why vertigo in Sjogren's often behaves differently from textbook cases. It may come on without warning. It may linger far longer than expected. It may partially improve, then return. It may not respond fully to repositioning maneuvers, motion exercises, or standard medications. Another key difference is that Sjogren's often affects more than one balance pathway at the same time. A patient may have mild inner ear dysfunction, small fiber neuropathy affecting positional feedback from the feet, and early brainstem involvement all occurring together. No single test will capture this full picture. From the outside, the symptoms look confusing. From the immune system's perspective, they are entirely consistent. This is why Sjogren's related vertigo is so often mislabeled as anxiety, age-related imbalance, or idiopathic dizziness. The problem is not that nothing is wrong. The problem is that the wrong framework is being used to explain it. Once you view vertigo through an autoimmune lens, the patterns begin to make sense. Peripheral vertigo refers to balance problems that originate outside the brain, most often in the inner ear or the vestibular nerve. 
In Sjogren's syndrome, this is one of the most common places where vertigo begins, and also one of the most frequently misunderstood. The vestibular nerve carries movement and position signals from the inner ear to the brainstem. In classic teaching, this nerve is affected by viral infections, trauma, or mechanical disruption. In Sjogren's, the immune system itself becomes the aggressor. Autoimmune vestibular neuritis occurs when immune-mediated inflammation interferes with how the vestibular nerve transmits signals. The nerve may not be damaged enough to show up clearly on imaging, but it becomes unreliable. The brain receives delayed or distorted information from one side, creating a powerful sense of spinning or imbalance. Patients often describe sudden onset vertigo that feels severe and disorienting. Nausea and vomiting are common. Walking in a straight line becomes difficult. There may be a constant feeling of being pulled toward one side. Unlike viral neuritis, there is often no preceding illness and no clear timeline for recovery. This is where many Sjogren's patients are told they have benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Repositioning maneuvers may help temporarily or not at all. The symptoms return because the problem is not loose crystals. It is ongoing inflammation. The inner ear itself can also be affected. Sjogren's can alter blood flow and fluid regulation within the vestibular apparatus, leading to pressure changes that mimic conditions like Meniere's disease. Patients may experience episodic vertigo, ear fullness, tinnitus, or fluctuating hearing, even when audiograms appear largely normal. What makes peripheral vertigo in Sjogren's especially challenging is that it rarely exists in isolation. It often overlaps with nerve dysfunction elsewhere in the body, setting the stage for balance problems that are more persistent and less predictable than standard peripheral vertigo. Understanding this distinction is critical, because treating inflammation is very different from treating a purely mechanical disorder. One of the most under-recognized contributors to vertigo in Sjogren syndrome is small fiber neuropathy. These are the thin nerves responsible for transmitting pain, temperature, and subtle positional information from the body to the brain. They do not control strength, which is why standard nerve tests often miss them. Balance depends heavily on constant feedback from the feet, ankles, and legs. Every step you take sends information upward, telling the brain where the body is in space. When small fiber nerves are damaged or inflamed, that feedback becomes unreliable. The brain compensates by leaning more heavily on vision and the vestibular system. During the day, this compensation can hide the problem. At night, in low light or with eyes closed, the system collapses. This explains why many people with Sjogren's report that their vertigo and imbalance are worse in the dark, worse when getting up at night, and worse when walking on uneven ground. It also explains why falls often happen during routine movements rather than dramatic ones. The sensation is not always classic spinning. Many describe it as floating, swaying, rocking, or feeling disconnected from the floor. These descriptions are often dismissed because they do not fit textbook vertigo. In reality, they are exactly what you would expect when proprioceptive input is failing. Small fiber neuropathy also interacts with the autonomic nervous system, which controls heart rate, blood pressure, and blood flow. This can further destabilize balance, especially when changing positions. When this layer is ignored, vertigo is treated as an ear problem alone. When it is recognized, the broader neurological picture finally comes into focus. Central vertigo originates within the brain itself, most often in the brainstem or the cerebellum. These areas are responsible for integrating balance signals, coordinating eye movements, and maintaining posture. When they are disrupted, vertigo becomes more persistent, less positional, and far harder to ignore. In Sjogren syndrome, central vertigo is usually driven by immune-mediated inflammation rather than a single structural lesion. The immune system can affect small blood vessels, neural pathways, and processing centers without leaving dramatic changes on imaging, especially early in the disease course. Patients with central involvement often describe vertigo that is constant rather than episodic. It does not reliably improve when lying still. Turning the head may worsen symptoms, but position alone does not explain them. There is often a sense of internal motion rather than clear spinning, as if the body is moving even when the room is not.
Eye symptoms are common. Difficulty focusing, blurred vision, or brief double vision can occur because the brainstem coordinates eye movements in response to head motion. When that coordination breaks down, the eyes and balance system fall out of sync. Coordination may also suffer. People may feel clumsy, misjudge distances, or struggle with fine motor tasks during flares. Speech can feel slightly slurred or slowed, particularly when fatigue is high. Because imaging can appear normal, these symptoms are frequently attributed to anxiety, vestibular migraine, or stress. In reality, they reflect disruption in the central processing of balance information. Central vertigo is where Sjogren's overlaps most dangerously with other neurological conditions. Recognizing this pattern is essential, because central involvement signals a deeper level of disease activity that requires careful evaluation rather than reassurance alone. Vertigo that originates in the brain raises immediate concern for serious neurological disease. This is where Sjogren syndrome most often collides with conditions doctors are trained to recognize, and where misdiagnosis becomes common. Posterior circulation strokes are a classic cause of sudden vertigo. These strokes affect the brainstem and cerebellum, the same regions involved in balance. Symptoms may include abrupt vertigo, difficulty walking, double vision, slurred speech, or weakness. Sjogren's related inflammation can produce a nearly identical presentation. The difference is not always obvious in the moment. Stroke symptoms tend to be sudden and fixed. Sjogren's symptoms may fluctuate, partially improve, or recur during immune flares. But early on, the overlap is close enough that every acute episode must be taken seriously. Multiple sclerosis is another frequent diagnostic detour. Both MS and Sjogren's can cause brainstem symptoms, relapsing neurological episodes, visual disturbances, and white matter changes on MRI. Some Sjogren's patients are told they might have MS but do not meet criteria. Others are treated for MS only to continue worsening. The problem is not confusion between the two diseases. The problem is that Sjogren's is often excluded too early. Sjogren's can cause central nervous system involvement without following the classic MS pattern. When clinicians are unfamiliar with this, patients end up in diagnostic limbo. They are told nothing serious is wrong, yet their symptoms persist and evolve. Understanding this overlap is critical. It explains why so many people with Sjogren's spend years cycling between specialists without a coherent explanation for their vertigo. The danger is not asking hard questions. The danger is stopping the investigation too soon. This is where many Sjogren's patients feel gaslit, even when no one intends to do harm. Most vertigo evaluations are designed to detect a short list of problems. Doctors look for loose inner ear crystals, clear nerve damage, large strokes, tumors, or classic demyelinating disease. If those are not found, the workup often stops. But Sjogren's related vertigo does not announce itself that way. Autoimmune inflammation can disrupt function without destroying structure. Nerves can misfire without being severed. Blood flow can fluctuate without leaving permanent damage. Timing between signals can break down without producing a visible lesion. An MRI can look normal while the brainstem is inflamed at a microscopic level. Hearing tests can be normal while vestibular signaling is distorted. Standard nerve studies can be normal while small fiber nerves are impaired. This is why patients hear phrases like, everything looks fine, or, there's nothing to explain these symptoms. What that usually means is that the tests were built to rule out emergencies, not to identify immune-mediated dysfunction. Another issue is fragmentation. NT specialists focus on the ear. Neurologists focus on the brain. Rheumatologists focus on systemic disease. Vertigo in Sjogren's often sits at the intersection of all three, and no single test captures the full picture. When tests are interpreted in isolation, the pattern is missed. When symptoms are viewed together, the explanation becomes clearer. A normal test result does not invalidate lived symptoms. It simply tells you where the problem is not, not where it is. Understanding this helps patients stop blaming themselves and start asking better questions. Evaluating vertigo in Sjogren's syndrome requires a different mindset than standard vertigo workups. 
The goal is not to find a single dramatic abnormality. The goal is to identify patterns of immune-mediated dysfunction across multiple systems. A proper evaluation starts with history and pattern recognition, not machines. The first step is a detailed neurological examination, with close attention to eye movements, gait, coordination and subtle asymmetries. Abnormal eye tracking, delayed saccades, or imbalance during head movement often provide more information than imaging alone. Brain MRI should include careful assessment of the brainstem and cerebellum. A normal scan does not rule out Sjogren's involvement, but focal changes, subtle white matter abnormalities, or progression over time can support central involvement when interpreted in context. Vestibular testing should go beyond positional maneuvers. Caloric testing, video head impulse testing, an evaluation of vestibulo-ocular reflexes help identify signal mismatches that standard exams miss. When symptoms include burning, tingling, numbness, or unexplained imbalance, evaluation for small fiber neuropathy becomes important. This may involve skin biopsy or specialized autonomic testing, as routine nerve conduction studies often appear normal. Autonomic testing is useful when vertigo worsens with standing, position changes, or fatigue. Blood pressure instability and heart rate variability can destabilize balance even when the inner ear is intact. Laboratory evaluation should include autoimmune markers and inflammatory indicators, interpreted alongside symptoms rather than in isolation. Normal blood work does not exclude neurological Sjogren's, but abnormal patterns can strengthen the case. In complex cases, collaboration between neurology, rheumatology, and otology is often necessary. Sjogren's related vertigo rarely fits cleanly into one specialty. Diagnosis in this context is cumulative. It emerges from repeated observations, symptom behavior over time, and how different systems interact. When the evaluation is done this way, unexplained vertigo often becomes explainable. Vertigo is not a disease. It is a warning signal that the brain's sense of orientation has been disrupted. In many people, that disruption comes from a simple mechanical problem in the inner ear and resolves with time or treatment. In Sjogren's syndrome, it is often more complicated. Sjogren's related vertigo does not follow a single pathway. It can begin in the vestibular nerve, emerge from impaired sensory feedback in the body, or originate within the brainstem and cerebellum themselves. In many cases, more than one of these mechanisms is active at the same time. That overlap is what makes the symptoms persistent, confusing, and easy to dismiss when viewed in isolation. The common thread is immune interference. Inflammation alters how balance signals are transmitted, timed, and interpreted. The system does not fail all at once. It degrades unevenly. The brain compensates until it can't, and vertigo appears as the visible consequence of that breakdown. This is why normal scans, normal ear exams, and partial responses to standard treatments do not mean nothing is wrong. They mean the explanation sits outside the usual boxes. When vertigo is framed only as an ear problem or only as a brain problem, Sjogren's remains invisible. When it is framed as a network problem, the patterns finally align. Understanding this does not make the symptoms disappear, but it changes how they are interpreted, investigated, and taken seriously. It shifts vertigo from something to endure into something to understand. And once the right framework is in place, the conversation stops being about reassurance and starts being about clarity.